Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are live now. Welcome to this session on competing in a leaderless world, which is part of the Horasis Extraordinary Conference with over 800 speakers. And I've got a very interesting panel here, extremely interesting, accomplished people in their own fields, very, very enlightened. We will be talking about leadership. We'll talk about challenges. We'll talk about experiences. We'll talk about the fact that the world is a little polarized at the moment and not really globalized as it should be. And we'll talk about how we can combat these challenges. Everybody here has varied experience. We have Rogerio Alexandra, who's the president of Barclays in Portugal. We have Bo Anderson, who's the president of Yazaki North and Central America, Europe, as well as Africa and the US. That covers almost the whole world. Nicholas Johnson, who is Chief Executive Officer, Economists Without Borders in Australia. Mariana Todorova, who is the Founder and Chief Executive Officer of DG Agora 2.0, Bulgaria. And we have Kiao Mu, who is an entrepreneur in China and leads a team of 100 people online. So, a wonderful panel and it's going to be over to Mariana to start off the proceedings. Here you go, Mariana. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Vinay. Thank you for introducing me and thank you for having me here today. My experience both for politics and academia shows me that the principles of a good governance are all the same, no matter we consider a government company or other organization. As a former advisor of the President of the Republic and former member of Parliament and now as a starting entrepreneur, I claim we need a paradigm shift in terms of uh, leadership and governance that includes uh, decentralization, democratization, and digitalization. And that's why so many new concepts appear, such as shareholders' activism, patient democracy, more pharma sector, cooperacy, where people are defined not by hierarchy, uh, but by certain roles. We as a corporate uh, or a political representatives or community members still have the necessity of hierarchy, but in terms of bearing responsibility. But my claim as a futurist too is that we are entering a new era, an era of cooperation, from cooperation of solutions and services to cooperation of meaning and values. And that's why my started a startup company elaborated a blockchain platform for decision making, consensus building and electronic voting. And this platform is created to empower social and civil movements, public companies and governmental bodies uh, to uh, have an effective communication system that brings engagement of their shareholders, members, and stakeholders in an inclusive and secure way. And what is most important, uh, it applies liquid or delegative democracy for much more fluid, transparent, and a new type of governance. And for those who don't know liquid or delegative democracy is a way to vote directly or to delegate your voting right to a confided person, an expert during the decision making or consensus building process. Thank you, Mariana. Very enlightened thoughts and they will be very useful to people who are listening. I'm going to go straight to Mr. Anderson now. Bo, over to you for your opening remarks. Every day we hear about electrical cars and what is the future of mobility. How many electrical cars are sold in a year in China, US and Europe? You may be surprised, but last year less than 4% of the cars sold in China were full electric. Less than 4% of the European cars were full electric. And in the United States less than 1%. Why do I bring it up? We see a lot of changing trends, but in reality, we are moving very slowly. I think all of us need to adjust to a new level of mobility, especially with the corona crisis. Thank you, Bo. That is absolutely correct, and we agree with you. I'll come back to you with a question later. 
it's over to nicholas now to talk about the economy and the challenges good day from australia uh so we see ourselves in 2020 with a challenging outlook for the next decade and i really think that looking back with the benefit of hindsight 2020 will be seen as the year of deglobalization so we have seen for the last decade uh increasing economic complexity and uh heightened tensions between uh, the united states and china as well as uh, an overall uh trend of surging populism and nationalism but the year 2020 has brought all this to a head and these changes have been accelerated by the the covid fueled recession and also the changes we've seen in the world as a result of that so we now look at this uh very high volatility and high high risk outlook for the economy over the next few years and i want to uh, touch on three things so first of all we're going to re- have to rethink how global supply chain is structured so i think for decades a lot of executives have been relying upon you know david ricardo's theory of comparative advantage and um we've had these um just in time global supply chains which um have perhaps shown, been shown to be inherently fragile and and risky so uh we're going to need to have a rethink about how this is structured um in light of the the covid crisis and the surging populism that we've seen has in part been fueled by the um fact that the distribution of benefits from this trade has perhaps not been as equitable as it ought to have been secondly there have been mounting pressures from a lack of monetary discipline so many central banks have had to resort to extraordinary and unconventional forms of monetary policy now this tends to create an unstable fo- uh, footing for the world financial markets and an increasingly asset dependent global economy we have the unique um phenomenon now we have a lot of cheap money with not necessarily many places to go and it's chasing many for returns and thirdly i think that global organizations will need to consider restructuring themselves for changing times so in the in light of deglobalization is a global organization the best structure maybe we need to consider moving to networks and affiliates which maintain the benefits of knowledge transfers but enable us to decentralize capital allocation decisions and the location of labor we've seen that work from home has largely been a success and in fact it has accelerated a lot of the change in the workplace and the uptake of technology which makes this possible so to summarize i think that we are in a stage of a great reset in the words of professor schwab of the world economic forum i like to think of it as the great metamorphosis so in 2020 the world is shrinking into its cocoon the next couple of years are going to be critical if we seize on these opportunities and invest wisely we could emerge to a more beautiful world just like a butterfly Thank you Nicholas very well said and very good summary as well. Over to you Rogerio for your opening remarks. Thank you and a uh, good morning good afternoon uh, depending on the time zone where uh, you are listening to, to us. Um first of all uh, thank you Vivek and um, for this opportunity. Uh, actually when we in a couple of months uh, we moved from a one style one lifestyle one life of one style of management to a totally new management in when they had to adapt um to a completely different way of doing business and managing people and also managing the the client's expectations therefore it was a, a, a fantastic effort for a for a management standpoint from to move from uh, office to home um doing business as we are doing now instead of sitting in a room um it caused a number of challenges to manage people to manage uh, to motivate uh, to focus uh, to keep morale high so uh, uh, to control people um to control the the quality of the work being performed to manage the staffing for projects so everything changed almost overnight and that caused uh, a a number of challenges from a management standpoint not also up but also da- up and down so all across the organization so for you, for you to to have an, an idea in in about one month or so uh, or 15 days to actually a little, little over two weeks 
in an organization of around about 80,000, over 80,000 people, 90% were working from home, which was a very challenging environment while keeping clients happy, while keeping projects going, while keeping life as probably people to notice the least uh, change. So that this caused uh, a number of, of, of ch challenges. The other thing that it is extremely important is while you meet, you manage people you know, it's more or less kind of easy to carry on motivating people, carry on controlling people, carry on controlling projects, carry on planning, etc. The big change was when new joiners, when someone comes from new to the organization, how to integrate people, how to bring, how to deliver, so to speak, the culture to the people, to the new joiners, how to keep morale, how to keep enthusiasm going, how to keep people motivated. So this is something that uh, caused a number of challenges for management uh, in the organization. And um, and uh, and it's important that we could, I'm sure we probably have some some uh, some questions uh, in, in another location to, to, to answer, but um, uh, to keep the execution going, and this is all about execution, the way you execute things. Uh, and uh, execution, execution, and execution is the name of the game. It is part of the, of the menu. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, Thank you. Uh, for, the, for the next questions. Thank you. Yeah. So it's over to Xiao now for the for your opening remarks. Xiao. Hi. It's my turn. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank the organization for inviting me. It's my great honor to attend this conference. As a Chinese, especially a Chinese female uh, who is involved in new social retail, I'm also going through this reform with less uh, leadership. I came back to China to start my own business in November last year. And now, uh, less than one year, my turnover is more than 8 million RMB, which is also due to the leaderless community. Um, and first of all, I will make a brief self-introduction. My, my name is Xiao Mu. After graduating in 2014, major in computer science, I went to work in Japan until uh, November last year. From the, from the beginning of software engineer and then overseas marketing expansion, during this period in 2016, I experienced a great earthquake in Kumamoto, Japan, uh, which attracted worldwide attention. The magnitude of Kumamoto earthquake is 7.3. After this rebirth, uh, I asked myself, <laughs> is this work I like? After a long time of inner exploration, I found that I was more interested in communicating with people. So I chose the overseas marketing. It, uh, it gives, uh, my, gives me an uh, opportunity to, stu uh, to study business. Um, as a developed country, Japan has a very sound system with a clear relationship between superiors and subordinates, 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 sorry. Yes, on, the yes. other, <laughs> yeah. on the other hand, uh, China, my hometown, uh, my home country is experiencing an all around economic development. New media and new internet are developing more and more rapidly. And I decided to come back to China last year. And, um, Thank you. Thank you. I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you with a question later, Kiao. And okay. now it's time for the questions. I'm very uh, impressed with the panel because they're all very disciplined people sticking to the time schedule. And also the content is absolutely high quality. I think that we are touching upon the subject very well. It's about leadership. Ultimately, it's about people. 
and ultimately all the systems we put in place and all the computerization and the automation and the artificial intelligence has to be led by human beings who are leaders so if we don't have leadership of high quality in the world across countries then we are going to suffer as a globe as a global population we need to develop that we need to inspire that we need to work on that and i'm going to request mariana now to talk about the my question to you mariana is how should organizations and individuals prepare themselves for the future just in a couple of minutes if you can tell us now yes of course uh, as a futurist and as a author of books and uh, trend scout i could say that the world is in expectation of several key transforming mega trends of large perceived as uh, evolutionary steps which will topple uh, totally change the reality and normality such as we know them and each radical change until now uh, brought us to qualitative uh, leaps but now we will face a quantum leap which will be the result of um, synergy between uh, all new technologies uh, digitalization robotization uh, artificial intelligence nanotechnology synthetic biology uh, internet of things uh, virtual reality augmented reality etc so we will also experience the economy of dehumanization and then we will need uh, more inclusion and involvement of people to rehumanize business and companies where the leading competitive factor again will be and will be more than ever important the talent imagination and innovation but we have to put an accent on people and we have to include them on a new way very well said i think i totally agree that talent is what matters and we have to think in new ways is it is an evolving world it is not a stagnant world we really need to think of that and now i'm coming to bo anderson you work across countries bo you have a lot of challenges in different countries i i suspect so i want to ask you what are these challenges in different countries how are your experiences i know it's a long answer but whatever you can summarize yeah first i i see that we have had four challenges during the last seven months first every country has acted differently secondly it's not the right time to have 140000 employees in 29 countries but our first focus has always been the health and safety of our employees third the important thing is to give leadership and fourth is to challenge everything we do absolutely well said bo i totally agree and with 29 countries to handle and as a company motivation morale all these things also go a long way so since uh, rogerio has just i think dropped off for a minute i'll ask you bo another quick question maybe you can answer quickly so how do you keep them all motivated bo all these uh, employees 140000 first we challenge everything secondly we see where can we strengthen our business third we have given responsibilities to our leaders and fourth unfortunately we are parting with the people that are not seeing the future and are willing to step it up and fifth we are strengthening everything we can do simplifying and moving faster very good very very succinct and well said i think these will be very effective and it's good leadership that i can see from you and uh, now we move to nicholas nicholas all these different countries with different kinds of leaders their economies are now you know dependent only on uh, internal uh, kind of activities they don't want to collaborate with other countries across the border so this very difficult world that we are coming across at the moment even parochialism is taking rearing its ugly head how do we accept and face these challenges yeah so we see an increasing fragmentation i think in in the world economy um and in some ways it mirrors the fragmentation that we see in some technology platforms and so there are some parallels you can probably draw 
Um, so, for instance, we often find with technology that um, an industry will become most efficient when there are a small number of technologies which are most really widely adopted because um, you know that uh, everyone else is likely to be able to use that technology, understand it, and speak the language. And so, you know, arguably companies like, like Microsoft and, and Google um, and, um, and, and Adobe and these, these technology companies which, you know, offer very widely used products, um, part of their success has been the ubiquitousness of their, um, of, of their technology. And when you have fragmented technology solutions, you're often, you find a, a dropping in, in efficiency. And we see the same thing in the world market. So if um, com- uh, countries tend to compete with each other uh, in a way which creates greater fragmentation of regulatory systems and less integration, we find that the world economy becomes less efficient. And really, the nature of the market changes, okay? So it becomes more, more competitive, but we also see a greater dis- uh, distinction between different market systems. And, um, you know, as we all know, when it comes to trade, who controls the flows really determines who has the power. And I think we're going to see this play out over, over the next decade. Nicholas, a quick counter question. Which of the countries do you think are doing well? I mean, we can at least name them. I mean, a couple of uh, dining examples in this very uh, downtrodden kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, do you mean well in terms of the, the COVID in crisis? The, being well led, yeah, well led with good leadership. Yeah, well, uh, it, it's difficult to point to to um, any particular country. Um, I, I would talk about Australia, for instance, um, but uh, we haven't really had a first wave of coronavirus, uh, let alone a second wave. So uh, it, it's difficult to say. I think every country has different um, uh, approaches to, to, to addressing the crisis. And I think it's really too early to tell. We'll have to wait a few years and look, look at the yeah, data. That's, that's a very good answer. We're very diplomatic as well. Well done, well done. So, Kiao, I think uh, it's over to you now. Please talk about the challenge of running a business from your location in uh, China in Beijing. And then you have workers, I understand, across the country. So, and uh, using technology. Are you keeping them motivated? How is it going? Has your company suffered in this time? Is competition, uh, has, has competing with other companies become more difficult or are you facing the challenge? Oh, okay, okay. Um, uh, first of all, um, I didn't use e- English for several years, so I, um, I can't follow you all, but okay, I okay. can feel, uh, but I can feel you are humor and, and everyone is so handsome and beautiful. So it's a pity for me, uh, I can't get all the message. So I send my email to you. Oh, I want to keep touch with each other. Okay, Maybe. okay, okay. Mm, yeah. But for the, uh, for the question, I just want to, uh, say that, uh, now we do, uh, WeChat retail, social retail. Yeah. Everyone is working for ourselves and we do business through SNS and we sell things and do business with the uh, uh, customers. So everyone is working for themselves and to pursue freedom. So um, I think this, uh, this is a competition in uh, leaderless, uh, leaderless world. Yes, yeah. and I also have another question for you, Kao. So you have obviously been to Japan and worked in China and you have changed careers a number of times. So what is your uh, input to young people who are facing this challenge globally and may have to change their careers? Is it an easy transformation or is it difficult? Oh, yeah. yeah it's very difficult for me because all of my friends uh, not stand by me. I just want to influence more people to take their own way and we everyone can live in a brilliant and beautiful life just to follow our heart. Uh, so maybe it's my belief, belief. Yeah. So in your current phase of your career, are you feeling more uh, 
comfortable is it is a, is it a good time for you in your career or is it a challenging time which you are happy to uh, handle quickly uh, the short up question is are you comfortable in your career at the moment uh sorry i beg your i beg your pardon are you comfortable in your career right now these days is it a good time for you uh, yeah it's really a great time for me <laughs> yeah okay okay so we chat is helping you technology is helping you to stay not only stay afloat but also do well with your company and that's a good sign so i'm coming back to mariana mariana you can take about 4 to 5 minutes now because we have time and mariana i would like you to talk about competitiveness competitiveness and democracy which you have written about and how the future is going to pan out we also in the prior discussion discussed how yuval noah harari has given such good inputs for the 21st century but maybe just in 4 to 5 minutes your vision and how competitiveness can continue and flourish in democratic setups uh it's obvious that we have to reinvent ourselves uh we have to uh reinvent democracy governance and management and probably we can improve uh, competitiveness of companies or governmental institution by using new principles of democracy and that's why i'm a great admirer of liquid or delegative democracy because it's a combination between uh, direct and representative democracy and it's a way to combine the principles of those two ways of exercise this democracy both of inclusion people but at the same time give them opportunity uh, to delegate uh, their voting right when they don't feel competent enough on a certain question uh, so uh, it's very high the uh, heart give a exact prescription or to give some remedies for this how to help public companies or institutions but i think uh, if we and introduce uh, liquid or delegative democracy as a principle of governance not only in uh, political parties or in government but in all other institutions and public companies where people could uh, be involved on a horizontal way uh, equally it could be a good approach right 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 and mariana as a futurist what is your vision for let's say the next 20 years for the world do you think things are going to get better do you think we can also produce some uh, leaders who are going to be more visionary than the present set of uh, world leaders well it uh, depends you know the forecast and the scenario buildings are just to provoke thinking they are not to point what the future certain future will be but uh, uh we could see uh, some parallel process uh, uh, from why from one side we could see a decline of uh, a strong uh, leaders because uh, everybody in politics or in uh, public companies people are much more uh, hung on their Uh, public relations and their personal appearance not their abilities uh, at the same time we see a uh, mm-hmm. culture of of cultures and uh, values and it's very hard to orient uh, what is the uh, strong leadership and who is the successful leader uh, but uh, i count on that we could find ourselves uh, between all that processes of uh, uh introducing artificial intelligence uh, um, systems as a uh, decision makers and i believe that we uh, will survive as uh, humans uh, in terms of keeping us uh, uh objects of our decisions and keeping uh, our human sovereignty uh not providing them to technologies because it's uh, very important 
not to find uh, the heuristics and uh, the short decisions. Uh, that were my insights. We have not to uh, choose the easy ways. Right, right, right. And also, I must compliment you. You have been a politician. You're a professor. You're an author. So which of these roles is more uh, exciting and fulfilling for you? Uh, I, I'm more introvert, so I'm very much satisfied when I have the time to uh, spend researching certain topics and to write books. Uh, it, it, that is the most satisfying thing for me, for hey, reflections and insights. I'm sure the panel will agree me, with me when I say that if all politicians could be like you, then uh, the world would be a better place, I think. So before I go to Bo, let me just add a couple of thoughts of my own. Ultimately, I feel that the world needs visionary leaders, not only in government, but also in corporations, in private sector industry, in academicians. We need people who are actually raised to be leaders. In our education systems across the world, there are very few programs at the school level which encourage emotional intelligence, social emotional learning, people skills. If we are very good at academics or accountancy or uh, numbers, it's good, it's great. But we also need to understand how to conduct ourselves when we are in positions of authority, how to lead people who are maybe feeling stressed or challenged or people who are in some kind of strife because of the pandemic or other situations, visionary leadership of companies or governments or universities will take that institution forward. Because everybody's looking up at the leader and how the leader conducts him, himself or herself is really what matters in a crisis. When everything is hunky-dory or going very well, it's okay to be a leader. But when the challenge comes, that is the time. And you really have to step up and show that leadership quality and also communicate well enough in order to let the team understand what really is the vision forward. And often leaders may be good leaders sitting in their desks, but they have to be able to translate that vision to the commonest uh, worker. It's that's important. Uh, Bo, before I uh, come to you, I had uh, these thoughts, but I want to ask you, Bo, what is your vision for your company? I mean, whatever you can share with us for the next five years and how would you advise other CEOs to proceed generally? First, I would like to come back to what happened to us in April and May. So first, we lost all revenue overnight. And in that situation, we decided that we should focus on three things. So first, we wanted to impress the banks that we had a plan to pay down half of our debt. And I can say we have been successful with that. Secondly, we wanted to impress our best customers and show what our strengths are. And we also question if we should work with all customers. And third, since we are a large employer, we have reached out to local governments and invited them to our plants and shared our health and safety protocols. So these are the three things that we are doing to maintain leadership as one of the largest automotive suppliers in the world. I talked a little bit about technologies in cars. For us, as Yasaki, as a Japanese privately held company, we are prepared for gasoline and diesel driven cars. Today we have 33% global market share. We are prepared for hybrids. Today we have 50% market share on hybrids, and we also prepared for full electric vehicles. Here we have 50%. So my message is, in times like these, you need to challenge your people, you need to challenge your bank, you need to challenge your customer, and you need to ask yourself, what is the best play for you to play? Very well said, Bo. We know why you are a leader of so many uh, countries across the world for your company and uh, we can see that uh, very forthright vision, very effective leadership and that is what all of us on this panel are bringing in our various ways. Mariana in her own way, Bo in his own way, Nicholas with his academic thought process and translating that into action and Kiao as an entrepreneur who's leading the young people across 
and maybe some not so young people as well so before i come to nicholas in fact nicholas i'm going to talk about your book when i come to you but uh, kya just to ask you a quick question first changing the order once a little bit so kya uh, how do you inspire and motivate these people to keep working are you paying them at the same time are they are they absolutely motivated to work on their own or is it sometimes that you find it difficult in this challenging time okay first of all i will born their dream <laughs> okay Okay. And, then, and then teach them some uh, method to sell things and communicate with customers. And then um, we share. Uh, the <laughs> Sorry. You share ideas. You share thoughts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We share successful method every yes. day. So uh, for the same for the same goal, we every uh, every day we. talk to each other communicate by we chat and then to aim uh, ever goes every day every week every month yeah <laughs> that's okay, all okay, okay. you are from china so it's not fair for me to ask this question but did you find a difference in the work culture in japan wow in japan it's very difficult to sell things in japan yeah everyone working companies mm, yeah maybe there's a difference <laughs> yeah okay so coming to nicholas nicholas you've uh, got a great book and uh, you've written about industrial revolutions and you have a very uh, academic kind of thought process on that you've analyzed the various industrial revolutions you've talked in detail about the fourth industrial revolution but going going forward and i had a panel in horasis last time which was actually about the fifth industrial revolution and what are the sectors that the world is going to be focusing on how is technology going to help enable the world to improve its economic uh, performances so that maybe the common man the communist person can actually benefit from the advances that the world is making absolutely so in um in chapter 3 of um my book we uh presented basically a model of how what people value drives industrial revolutions and so it's really what people value which determines the technology that will come about in instead of um the technology which creates things of value um and so if you look at every single thing which people value whether it's, whether it's a good or a service it can be mapped to one of seven uh penultimate ends as we call it so there are three foundational ends there are three aspirational ends and there's one transcendental end so the three um foundational ends you know, it includes somatic stability so this is health of mind and body and so any good or service which allows someone to procure or sustain or to retain um sound uh, mind health and body that will be of value and then there is um social belonging so this is the sense of community people value community um it's the sense of um belonging being belonged having people you can spend good times with and the sense of feeling sort of loved and and supported and so any sort of technology which helps to facilitate greater community and greater community uh, community relations that will also be valued and we'll see this trend increase over time and the third um foundational end is um self determination so this is the the freedom to to think and to express yourself to, to travel freely and to explore and to basically pursue pursue your own ends so any technology which allows you to do that um uh it will also be valued and then you have the three aspirational ends so there's um status which is basically um when you feel that you're perceived to be either admirable or uh, possessing of qualities which are so and then there is is um security so this involves when you feel that you um have a secure place in life and you have risk risk management methods in place maybe you have some savings and some insurance or you have um technology to help protect your assets and your health and then there's and then there's strength so the strength is basically the ability to to uh, in, influence change in your environment and so it includes hard strength um and also soft soft strength and um you can uh bring that up to to a national scale as well in terms of diplomatic power 
And then finally, the the seventh penultimate end is um, the transcendental end. That's self-realization. And so when you have sufficient measure of the foundational and aspirational ends in place, then you have a progressive freeing up of your time to think about the higher order goals. And so technology, which allows you to really find fulfillment and meaning in your life, that um, allows you to achieve the, the transcendental end. I think, Nicholas, that's a very good vision because you even come to the highest level of self-realization, which is actually spirituality. And actually, that is something which I totally agree with. So I'm very happy to have Rogerio back. Very quickly, Rogerio, I want to ask you a question. How do you keep your people motivated in this challenging time? How are they inspired to work? Thank you. And I first of all apologize, but I mean, I, I cannot control technology. No problem. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, network. So going back. So it is uh, the key word here is um, actually bounded uh, optimism. Uh, it, it is uh, it is very important to, to keep uh, and bounded optimism is, is not is not positive thinking. It's not uh, blind faith. It's not a wishful thinking. No. Uh, nor are some kind of magical thinking. So um, it is actually conf uh, uh, confidence uh, combined with optimism um, uh, and to keep and maintain the, the team morale up. So it is very, very, very important, this one. Um, if um, one thing that we have experienced is that, uh, and seen in, in statistics, it, it's, it, it's that highly optimistic people are 103% more inspired to give their best at work. Um, so it is extremely important to boost morale and action. So people need to action and not stay at home and, uh, and, and, and sad and Etc. So it's very, very important that people keep morale and to boost morale. It actually stimulates uh, performance. Uh, it's important people be optimistic and to think that uh, instead of uh, yes, but it's yes and. So okay. put something more on it. Um, thank you, thank you, Rogerio. I think we are running out of time. So I got yes. your point to be optimistic, to be positive. Focus on, focus on solutions. Focus on solutions. So a quick closing remark from the other speakers, just one line or two lines summing up what you uh, had. Mariana. Uh, I should add that we have to be optimistic and we also have to trust to each other. Uh, I remember as a very strong uh, faith when I was on, on a conference that the trust is the currency of our time. So we have to turn trust into democracy and to make this principle to stay together. Very good, very good. Oh, over to you. So when you look at this health and economic crisis, as bad as it is, it's a huge opportunity. So first, challenge everything. Secondly, focus on creating value. Third, empower your best people. And fourth, painfully, <coughs> to depart from the people that cannot work in this environment. Excellent, excellent. Over to you, Nicholas. So if 2020 is the year of deglobalization, I want to reframe 2021 as the segue to globalization 2.0. So we see now many opportunities to invest if we're able to find them and we can invest to change the world and make it a better place. Thank you there. And Kiao, last one or two sentences. Okay. <laughs> I think we just need to make ourselves be trusted and provide help and share love to everyone and then everything will come back naturally. Thank you. Rogerio, last sentence. Last sentence uh, is actually over communication, team communication, team collaboration, empower and engagement. Wonderful panel. I'm so happy to have been uh, chairing this panel and uh, very nice of you all to put in your ideas. The good thing was that we all came from different countries, different accents and different mindsets, perhaps, but same goals and same overall thinking, <laughs> optimism, leadership, trust, futuristic thinking, vision, people centric thinking, innovation, trust in each other's leadership and innovation which reaches the common person. 
that is the key and leadership which can make a change to our company our country thank you very much all of you for being a part of this panel it's been a pleasure and we have an uh, thank you from anna also who's on the audience okay everyone and take care thank you cheers bye bye thank you, thank you. bye bye okay i think the formal part is over okay. it's very nice to meet you all and uh, let's all keep in touch i think we have an email uh, which is common to all we can stay in touch there and i must say all of you are very uh, capable people my best wishes to all and good communicators also chao you also spoke well despite having uh, not been in touch with english but i think you came up with good ideas i must compliment all five of you very well thank, thank you vivek thank you thank you all stay safe and thank you vivek thank you very much thank you both thank you thank you mariana chao nicolas and have a, have a wonderful day everyone bye bye sayonara bye bye sayonara <laughs> You can take a picture like this if you like. I think there's a picture here. I'm just taking it. One, two, three, go. Go. Yeah, it's already there. I think I'll be able to send it to you. All right. Thank, thank you. Cheers. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank bye bye. Bye. You can use the red button at the left to leave. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for for your for writing. Thank you all of you all. Thank you for that and send to you. Thank you. I have my new dream. Study English. <laughs> <laughs> all the best, Bo and Mariana. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.